there and welcome to The Knit Show. I'm Vicki Howell. Today we are going to be focusing on lace. We're going to be starting making this cool bandana kind of shawl scarfy thing with Mode Knits, Annie Moda set. Then we're traveling over to this great wood shop and we're going to have Harrison from Furls Crochet show us how he actually carves his hooks. Then we'll be back in the studio with Kristen Omdahl and she is going to be making this great crocheted loose beautiful vest. And now we're going to start our show the way that we always are in the Knit Hive. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi, I'm super excited because we've got moms in the house today. We've got two moms. We've got, okay, so we've got our production uh, coordinators, mom. This is, May is the production coordinator. We've got Sheila here. Hello. Hello. And then our director of photography, Ken, we've got his mom here. So hello, Susan. It's so good to see you guys. Thank you. Glad um, to be here. What? So let's start with you. Okay. I have to look at your earrings. You're wearing, Sheila, you're wearing crocheted earrings. Did you make yes. this? No. I got it when I was on holiday in Bahamas. It would have been a better story if you had made them. I wish I did. <laughs> but well, I could make one. I could duplicate it. You, can't, you, you could do it, but yes, you didn't I have could. to. What mm -hmm. are you working on now? I'm working on a hat. Um, this is for a safe place, it's children that... Uh, get uh, stay in safe place we make christmas presents for them safe place is a local charity here and it's um it's a place for um families who need to get away can go and have a safe harbor so domestic abuse cases yeah, often neglect abuse. that kind of thing um kristen omdahl our guest later actually has her own organization mm -hmm. that also um a portion of her proceeds actually go to help women um, who are experiencing domestic violence. So you, sh you should talk to her later. She's okay, that's amazing. Yeah, so anyway, so that. great to have you here and thank you thank for doing you. that. Um, Susan, are you, you're, you're straight up socking it right now. Do you make a lot this, of socks? This is my first sock. What? Yes. Right here? Yes. You're working on your first sock. My first sock. On camera. Yes. Not that you can tell. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Well, thank you. How, you. Well, you know, I immediately trust you because you're a redhead, <laughs> like right away. How long have you been knitting? I started knitting when I was a senior in high school. They, um, they decided to build us a new girls gym. And during the winter when it was bad out, they needed something for us to do, idle hands, you know. So they taught us how to knit. In gym class? In they gym you how class. To yeah, and that was a long time ago. Yeah, it's just I've never heard that before. Normally, if you learned how to knit, it would have been in home ec or whatever. So I kind of like, I kind of love that. Yeah. Were the guys in the boys' gym learning how to knit? During no, the it was it was just a girls' gym. So it was just it was just girls. Did so. you have? Did guys go to the school too? Yes. Mm. Yeah. We'll talk about that later. Okay. <laughs> um, Monica, you actually, I'm so interested because you live stream knitting, but not you know, where I do on Facebook Live or a lot of people on YouTube, you actually are on a gamers network, Twitch, right? I am. So twitch.tv is this awesome place where people can just get online, broadcast whatever they're doing. And yeah, it's aimed at gamers, but not everybody is good at games. Oh, you're not good at games. Oh, I'm awful. Believe it or not, I have terrible hand-eye coordination. Hmm. <laughs> So, so you knit. So I knit. Yeah. So instead of putting in that I'm playing Super Mario Sunshine or that I'm playing Zelda's Adventure, instead I just say I'm being creative right now and I knit and hang out with my friends. All right, so if you're not really great at games, why did you choose a gamer network to stream from? Are you just kind of a fangirl for games or did you just like that community for some reason? I got my start broadcasting through video game philanthropy, actually. Yeah. So me and a bunch of my friends raised thousands and thousands of dollars for charity by playing Zelda games. I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah. And so you, you started there and you just really liked the community and now you're bringing uh, yarn love over there. I would knit while my friends played video games and a lot of people talked about it and they said, you know, you could just knit. And I said, are, are you serious? Okay, I'll give it a try. And it's just been the most fun I have. I love that. Yeah. I love that. I love how um, just knowing how to do something like this kind of opens up community, especially in unexpected ways. That's so great. Well, thank you so much for being here. I figured you guys could just hang out in the hive and I'm going to go meet our first guest. Okay? Okay. All right. Bye. Bye. 
My first guest today is my friend, author, designer, and co-owner of Mode Yarns, Annie Moda. So it's so good to have you here. It is so good to be here. <laughs> I like the enthusiasm. I love you, Vicki. Well, gingers unite. I know, and what I love do? that you got first place, too. Um, in life. I just came in second. Oh, come on. There will always be first with me, love. Thank you. You have been in the industry for you know a long time. Well, you started designing in theater, and then you moved over to the knitting industry. What made you then transition into becoming you know, starting your own yarn line, a dyeing um, business? Well, I love color, and I had studied dyeing when I was in grad school because I studied costume and set design. But mostly, I felt like there was a big hole in the yarn world for beautiful hand-dyed yarns that were all machine washable. And I know that's yeah. kind of, you know, a lot of people, I don't like machine washable yarns, but I have to be totally honest, when I'm knitting a gift for someone, yeah. I don't like to give them care instructions. I just like to knit it for them, give it to them, and know that they can wash it. So all of your yarn lines are, like all weights all and everything yarn. are? The cottons, that's the great. linens, all of the blends are silks. They're all machine washable. Especially if you're knitting like a baby blanket <sighs> or something. You know, that's yes. so hard to make, you know, an already tired, like new parent, yep. then hand wash. So we're gonna be using some of your yarn today to make today's project. Yes, yes. So you've got a couple of examples here today. Um, let's talk about the one on the top. Sure, it's a scarf. This is a shawlette, and I call it a uh, girl's best friend because it's based around diamonds. It's a diamond motif. And um, in the pattern, I also photographed it as a kerchief on my puppy because he's my best friend. Adorbs. He's a girl's best friend. But the lovely thing about the pattern is you can either work it so that it's plain in the center, which mm -hmm. is how this one is worked. And you want to do it with that one because that yarn is so beautifully dyed that you want, really want it to showcase. Exactly. It's a color. We call this color Rory Gilmore. And it's very active. There's a lot going on. And sometimes with lace, the less active a color, the better. So in this case, we wanted to have a nice area in the center that's just plain stockinette stitch. Okay, but the one we're gonna be focused on today is actually stepping it up a notch because it's gonna carry the diamonds all the way up. All the way up. So let's start, why don't we just start? Okay. Let's get started. All right, so um, you're all set up here. And the first thing that um, people should notice is you work on circular needles because I easiest, love them. Yes. Easiest on your wrists. They're right? also, you can travel with them easily, and I travel a lot. Right. And these are signature needles, which I love for lace, because the tips, it's their stiletto tip, and it's amazing. Okay, and they're love and them. they're interchangeable, so you can change sizes whenever it's you great. want. It's great, and I change sizes all the time okay. as I'm working. So the first thing when you're knitting lace is you wanna make these holes. Those holes are what lace is, and I actually prefer not to call them holes. I like to call them eyelets because then it sounds like you meant for it to happen. Mm -hmm. And the way you make an eyelet is you do a yarn over. A yarn over is simply taking your yarn and wrapping it around your needle in the same direction as you would wrap it if you were forming a knit stitch. So now that I've wrapped my yarn around the needle, I just continue knitting, la 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 la, until I come to my next yarn over, wrap the yarn around, and then you just continue knitting. And that's how you make a yarn over. It's so simple. And I'm always surprised in my knitting classes how many people haven't made a yarn over. Right, and that's the foundation of all lace products All lace everywhere. knitting. Absolutely. Yes, exactly. And then a companion to the yarn over is a decrease. When you make a yarn over, you increase the number of stitches. So obviously, if you want to keep the stitch count regular, you need to do a decrease. This decrease is slightly advanced, but it's not difficult. Um, it's called a VDD, vertical double decrease, because decreases usually lean to the left or they lean to the right. But this decrease is centered. As you can see here, it's lovely and centered, and it balances the yarn overs happening on either side. Let's pull, I want them to see it, how beautiful it looks on it the It is, it's, I just love, it's my favorite decrease in the world. If I only had to use one decrease for the rest of my life. It's which... really nice, it's a really nice design detail. Thank you, I appreciate that. You're welcome. So what you do is you come to the point where you're about to make your VDD, and you have to remember the VDD happens over three stitches, over an odd number of stitches, because it's going to be balanced on that center stitch. So you insert your needle into the first two stitches as if you're working a knit two together. Okay. So slip it in, and then you just slip those stitches off. You knit the next stitch, and then you take those two that you slipped, and you pass them back over. 
And that's what gives you that really beautiful straight up and down decrease. Very okay, balanced. so you're slipping them at the same time together. Exactly. Okay, so then what's next? There, I'm gonna show you one of the other decreases, um, which I love. There are left slanting decreases and right slanting decreases. And here you can see that is a decrease that it's slanting to the right. This is a decrease that slants to the left. For most knitters, the left slanting decrease is generally not as good looking as the right slanting decrease, which has made me a little crazy. Right. I teach knitting, so I sort of took this apart. And you My, have an example too I, of the I different. Do. I Let's have show an them because here. I actually hadn't even really considered this before. So this is a great tip. Exactly. And now here you'll see, see how it looks like there's little, it looks like it's just really wiggly, that mm -hmm. line. And if you compare it to the right decrease, it's always nice and straight. And okay. it made me crazy. So here I have done what I call a lovely left decrease, still a little wiggly, but much nicer than before. And it's a very nice match for the right decrease. I'm gonna show you how I did that, because okay. it's, it's just a nice finesse type of thing to do. Well, you always give us a way to up, our, up the ante on our skills. That's I'm, one of the reasons I love having you here. I'm very fancy. Very you, are, fancy. you are super fancy. And schmancy. Ooh. So, yeah. So you work up to the point where you're going to make your decrease. Now, what you normally would do is just knit those two together through the back sure. loop or do an SSK or right. something like that. What I'm going to do is insert my needle into the first stitch and I'm gonna knit it by wrapping the yarn backwards. I'm wrapping the yarn opposite of how I normally wrap it. Okay. So don't fuss about it too much. Just say, normally I do this. Yeah. Okay, now I'm gonna do this. And then you wrap the next one opposite also. And then you continue on your merry way, blah, 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 blah. Right. When you get to the wrong side, which we have over here, you'll be purling back and having fun and totally forgot where you put those stitches until you get to the point where your needle is like, wait, I can't go in that stitch. Well, here is the stitch that we wrapped opposite and it's friend and they're sitting opposite on the needle. So that means you don't have to look it That's up. That's your visual cue. Exactly. Right. To do the decrease, you take your working needle, you insert it into the two stitches through the back loop. It's basically purling two together through the back loop. But what makes it an easier technique is that first step where you actually turn the stitches. Right. Then you don't spend your life going, wait, where is it? Wait, right, where is right, it? Right, right, right. That's great. Oh, no, that's, that's a really, really cool, cool technique. And we should also throw out there that um, it doesn't matter if you're a continental knitter, an English knitter, a combination knitter. Exactly. It's still the same technique. So if, if you see something that looks different than how you're doing, please don't feel like you're doing it wrong. As long as you, the job gets done, we're good. And then I just want to point out one more sure. thing. This is the right decrease. This is something a lot of people don't think about, but it's a really good tip. Your working needle will enter two stitches to work them together. That's how you make a decrease. Yep. The direction the tip is pointing, that's the direction that decrease will lay. Oh, that's a great tip. So as I put my needle in this and this, see how the tip is pointing to the right? That's gonna be a right slanting decrease. Okay, that's great. If I were to put it in like that, it'd be a left slanting decrease. You're so smart. I am, I'm very smart. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank that, you. This is a great project. Thanks. You call it a chalette because you're more ladylike than I am. I, I am. call it a bandit scarf. That's right. Either way, it's a great project. All right, and the pattern, both written and the chart for mm -hmm. it, and all the instructions that you need to make it any size that you want any size. to fit you in whatever yarn you want are on our website, theknitshow.com. Next up, we are headed over to a wood shop with Harrison from Furls Crochet to see exactly how you make a hook. We're at a woodworking studio with the founder of Furls Crochet, Harrison Richards. I'm so thrilled to be here with you. I really, really love your story, and I was hoping that you wouldn't mind sharing it with our viewers. Absolutely. So I started Furls from my parents' garage five years ago out of this want to make just a better crochet hook. The girl that I dated in high school was a crocheter. She loved crocheting, but I noticed that the hooks that she used didn't really match how much she loved crocheting. It didn't make sense. She poured so much love into what she did, why was the tool um, not as beautiful as what she thought she was doing? I was a woodworker in high school. I sat down at the lathe, I designed out a crochet hook for her, and I made her a beautiful crochet hook. And she loved it so much that she told all her crocheting friends about it, and I started to make them crochet hooks, and I actually started a small Etsy shop. So I sat down, started making crochet hooks one by one, 
probably for the first 1,000 crochet hooks. After those first 1,000 hooks, we started to bring on other people, other master woodworkers to make hooks for the crocheters that wanted them. Uh, and now, five years later, we've got crocheters using our hooks in all 50 states and 60 countries. That's fantastic, and I feel like your hooks really speak to your message. They're so beautifully made, and they have a really unique shape, and I was wondering if maybe you would show us how they're made. Absolutely. All Let's right. do it. Yeah, so I'm just bringing the blank down to um, round right now. It's a really nice piece of Coca-Cola. So I've got the uh, blank down to round now. I'm going to start to make my parting lines for the hook at the uh, front and the back. I'm going to make my parting line in the middle here start to form that teardrop shape. We've heard your great story. We've seen a little bit of your work, and now I am dying to see some of these beautiful hooks that you make. So will you kind of walk us through some of your stuff? Absolutely, yeah. So I think the first thing that you notice is that these don't look quite like conventional crochet hooks. Um, and there's a lot going on here. It's a bit of function meets form, form meets function. Obviously, the woods stand out, and we've got a lot of woods here that give a lot of different color variety, like purple heart, zebra wood some coca bolo. I love that. I love that you can pick a hook that is you. The other thing that's going on here is the shape. And it's not just a shape that we chose. It's not just you being fancy. No, no. It, it, it is a little bit. It is a little, it is a little, okay, bit. A little yeah. fancy, but also a lot of function. Absolutely. Okay. So the human hand has a joint in it called the metacarpal phalangeal joint. It runs around the fingers um, and all the ligaments and tendons that run through your fingers, roll over the metacarpal phalangeal joint, the MCP joint. Um, on average, it's about five-eighths to three-quarters of an inch wide, and we've embedded that dimension into the body of every single hook. So at its widest point of the teardrop here, we've mirrored the width of your MCP so that whether you're in pencil grip mm -hmm. or knife grip, all the tension that normally comes from your... Um, your wrist and your hand and your fingers gets distributed into the hook, takes the tension out, and allows you to crochet easier. Um, and we've also got the descending tail, which, when you're in uh, knife grip, allows your fingers to kind of adjust and grab at any point that you want. And everyone's hands are different. Right, but that'll we, really help tension. Exactly, exactly. Gives you a lot of control. Right. Well, those, those are gorgeous, but I know that you're also, you've kind of delved away even from wood, which right. is like crazy. Right, yeah. And um, you've made something a little bit kind of sleeker and sexier. Will you show sure. us what the next step is? Absolutely. So this is the entry-level line of Furl's hooks uh, called the Furl's Odyssey. I mean, it's like a sports car. Look at that. It is, and it's, it's actually, the paint job on it is the same paint that you find on a car. It's an automotive paint job with automotive clear coat on the back. So super smooth. Um, the back is high-quality poly resin, so very light. The second thing is the nickel plating. Mm -hmm. That adds strength to the hook so we can go super small. It also adds super smooth glide, so mm -hmm. stitches are just flying off the hook. Yeah, so this is going to make for speedier crochet. Exactly. Sure. Yeah. And that means more even stitches as well. Well, everything is gorgeous. I love the story. I love that you put your heart into everything, and I'm thrilled that you could be here with us on The Knit Show. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. We are back here in the studio, and my next guest is here all the way from Florida, my friend and owner of Kristen Omdahl Yarns, Kristen Omdahl. Hello, it's so good to see you. I'm thrilled to have you here. Thank you, great to be here, Vicki. I love all of the lightweight, drapey, airy pieces that you create in both knit and crochet, but today you've brought us a really beautiful, wearable piece that we're gonna make, and I'd love to just dive right into seeing what it is. It's a crochet vest, and it's, um, it's kind of an in-between piece. It's not quite a fitted garment, it's just a rectangular wrap with armholes in it. 
It has incredible drape because I use bamboo yarn. One of my yarns, Be So Fine yarn, is 100% bamboo, fingering weight yarn. And when you use a larger hook, just like with knitting lace, you get that amazing drape in the blocking process. Yeah, I can totally see you throwing this over like your yoga gear or over like jeans and boots or whatever. It's really versatile and you don't have to worry about a lot about sizing or anything. You can so size great. it in different ways. To, I'm sorry, style it in yeah. different ways too. You can tie it and it gives you more of a fitted look oh. in the front or wear it open. And you can always wrap it around your neck like a voluminous scarf too. Why not, why not? All right, so let me ask you this. If people are new to crochet, do you think that they can wake this piece? Absolutely, there's single crochet, double crochet, and chain, the three basic stitches. It's just what you do with them. Right, and also you were showing, so you have a piece over here. This is a little mini version of what's up there so that you can see the shape. The other thing, we were talking about this before we started, how this is just a great stepping stone from say a scarf or a wrap. Absolutely, there's a lot to do, there's a lot of difference between making a two-dimensional garment and a three-dimensional garment. So going from two-dimensional and just adding a couple of sleeve holes, you create this illusion of a three-dimensional fitted garment when you haven't done any shaping at I all. I love it. I love when things look fancier than they are. Me so too. So why don't we dive right in and get started with the actual crochet. Here you okay. go. Yeah, I do a technique called foundation ovals, and it's like a cross between a beginning chain and a foundation stitch because it's invisible like a foundation stitch, but it's a lot stretchier than a beginning chain. And so you start with a chain four, and then you double crochet into the fourth chain from your hook. And you do the number of repeats that you need for your project, and you work into these holes created from the, the oval rather than working into a chain or a stitch. So I'll show you one more. So you can see that there's, we'll now have two foundation ovals. And to just refer back to the sample here, I wanna show you that those foundation ovals are done in the center here. We work out from the center in both directions, and you can see it's virtually invisible it in there. It absolutely is. And it's worked out from center out so that you can have the same flowy edge facing the same direction or opposite direction rather on either side. Right, the edging is then a mirror on both sides and identical. Perfect, okay, so this is what, and again, we're working in a smaller form, we're working this small form because it's easier to see. So your piece would be much larger. Okay, so now in order to work at the, into the foundation ovals, we're gonna work our stitches right into them. So we're starting at the beginning of row one. We do a chain three to count as the first double crochet and work two more double crochets into that same oval. Now, instead of working into a beginning chain or foundation stitches, we just work whichever part of the repeat into those ovals, which is a lot easier to see than chains as well. So we did a chain three. We're gonna work three double crochets now into the next oval. And let's just refresh the double crochet. So oh yes, of course. I'll let you finish that one yeah. and then go on so to the So we're gonna one. yarn over our hook, insert your hook into the specified spot, yarn over, pull up a loop. You now have three loops on the hook, yarn over, pull through two, yarn over, pull through two. Perfect, and that's really as hard as this project gets. So if you've got that, you exactly. got it all. Exactly, so we'll do another one to finish that portion of the repeat. And then we'll move on and show you how to do the next row. I'm gonna take these out of there so we don't cover your chart. Yes. There you go. Oh, there's one other stitch, and that would be slip stitching. And so in order to create this beautiful, you notice how it even has edging on the sides here. I did, It's That's because lovely. you slip stitch at the beginning of each row to get to the spot you need to be in, and it creates that self edging along the sides too. Another way that this is deceptively more simple than it looks. So we're slip stitching into our first chain three space. And now we're ready to start our row, and our row starts with a chain four, which counts as the first double crochet in chain one. And we're gonna double crochet chain one, whoops, into that same space. We want a total of six double crochets in that space to create that first scallop. So in, in crochet, when you work a bunch of double crochets together that, and it forms a fan, they're called scallops. Correct, it's more concentrated at the bottom and more fanned out at the top, so it gives you that scalloped. Okay, Beautiful perfect. shape. Would you mind also just pointing out on the chart, just for visual reference, what you just worked? Definitely, so row one was working, well first we did the foundation stitches along here, and then row one began with the chain three, and then two double crochets in that first foundation oval. We did a chain three, and three double crochets in the next foundation oval, and then you would continue on to the end of that row. Then you would pick up 
and slip stitch across to the chain three space like we just did for row two, chain four, which counted as our first double crochet chain one, and there's that scallop Perfect. that we just did. Perfect, and that chart will be available on the website. Okay, so we've worked those. Yes, yeah, so where you're, are we at? Wor you're working a three row repeat. So once you do the three row repeat, you're just repeating that until you get to the armhole. And what's cool about the armhole is you already know everything you need. Oh, to do it. So what I'm going to show you is that we do the foundation ovals again to create that armhole opening. We're going to replicate the number of foundation ovals that we need for however much of our repeat we want to open for the armhole. So we worked this row to the spot we want to start the armhole and we're going to start with a chain three, chain, I'm sorry, chain four and double crochet into the fourth chain from our hook and there's our first foundation oval. Now this pattern has a multiple of five foundation ovals per repeat. So however, however large you want your armhole, you'll want to make sure that you adjust accordingly to how many stitches your, re uh, your repeat is. Right, so you could so adjust skipping. this if you wanted a little bit more roominess in the arm or less, that, this Correct. is where you'd make that adjustment. So you're gonna make your foundation ovals and skip the appropriate number of stitches and then continue on in your pattern after you've skipped the correct number of stitches for the correct number of foundation ovals you've added. Okay, great. And then there's one, one more part to learn in this project. So it's big, it, there's a lot to it, but it's all really simple steps that you're just repeating. So mm -hmm. once you get it, you're just doing it for a while. Absolutely. And having an amazing piece to show for all of your efforts. So here's one side of the miniature already done, worked all the way out, minus the edging. And what you're gonna do now is come back to the opposite side of those foundation ovals. And by working into the foundation ovals, instead of stitches or chains, you're going to have this beautiful invisible edge and it worked out identically from both sides. All right, so I would love it if you would just show people how you're gonna get pick up and start from here um, because it's a little bit different when you're working in this side of a chain. Like right, in working way. in the first side and the second yeah. side is slightly different. You're working in the opposite side of it. So we worked from here this direction. So mm -hmm. now you've got it facing you in the opposite direction and you wanna slip stitch into that first oval and once you do that, you're doing it exactly the same. You're gonna chain three and double crochet into the opposite side of that same oval. And at this point, it actually looks more like an oval because you've had the pressure of working stitches into both it. sides. Yeah. You know what I love about that is because I, chain, chain, regular chain stitch can be really tight. Foundation chains, or foundation, excuse me, sorry, single crochet, or whichever one that you need, foundation stitches in general can be really bulky. Correct. So this sort of solves that, it gives it kind of an airiness and, and really makes it fit, mesh with the lace. Well, and also, it, when you're not using the other side, it just gives a nice scalloped edge. You notice how in the armholes, we only work into one side, unlike the center spine. So you see you have the second benefit that it has a scalloped edge. So if you did it at the top of a top-down sweater, it's just a scalloped edge on the neckline. Oh, I like that. That's a great kit tip. Well, this is beautiful. I would absolutely wear this. I would actually love one in black, dark like my soul. <laughs> um, I love it. You have great colors, a lot of sheen, um, and I really just, I, I dig your work. Thank you so much for being here and for sharing this lovely lacy piece with us. You're welcome. <laughs> Next up, I am going to talk blocking. All right, let's talk blocking lace. So it can be a little fussy when you're trying to block something, especially if it's a really big shawl or blanket or a table runner. So you can use a folded up towel on a counter, tape it down, go through all of that. You could also use a mattress if you wanted to, or maybe a carpet if it's super padded. But if you have something like these lace block mats, it makes it really easy and portable anywhere. So they come in a square, they kind of look like kids' play mats, but they've got a special top so that your piece doesn't slip around. So you just put as many squares as you want for how big your piece is. All right, so then you're gonna lay your piece out on it. And I have just kind of a small swatch, and it doesn't matter if it's knit or crochet. This happens to be crochet. You're gonna lay it out as you would. Now here, you have choices. So you can use T-pins, we've all used them. They're fine, it's just a little tedious, and sometimes they can cause your blocking to have little lumps in it. So we have a great solution, our friends over at Knitter's Pride, if you're in North America, Knit Pro elsewhere, have these great 
this great blocking tool that has a bunch of steel pins on it, and they don't rust, so it won't. You don't have to worry about getting any stains on your beautiful work. So all you do is you lay stuff out. Now you can do, you can work on a straight edge like this, and you just poke them in, and it's super easy. But what's also cool is that they work if you have any hanging motifs like this piece because you can just grab the tip of both of them and get them down. So they come with the wider ones, but they also come with smaller ones. So that if you really, as the pieces get, the um, motifs get closer, you can still work together. So you would just do that all the way around until, so that it's either at the measurements or the shape that you want. And then just take a plain old spray bottle, spritz it, let it dry. When you're done, your lace piece is going to look beautiful. All right, that's it for us today. Thank you so much for watching from home and learning a little more about lace. Thanks to my Knit Hive for hanging out and knitting with us. As always, you can find all of the patterns and supplies and everything you need to know to make anything in the entire series and this episode at theknitshow.com. Next up, our episode will focus on amigurumi. Those are those knit and crochet animals that we all know and love. And we're going to have designer Twinkie Chan with us. Also, crafty as cool as Allison Hoffman. Until then, please be sure to make a little time to do some stitching. Breathe in, knit out.